Hello, everybody. So I'm going to get started a little bit early because I have a little bit more material to cover. Uh, my name is Jacob Schreiber. I'm a fourth year graduate student and IGERT Big Data Fellow at the University of Washington. For the last few years, I've been working on this side project, Pomegranate, which implements fast and flexible probabilistic modeling in Python, implemented in Cython for Speed. So if there's one thing that you get out of this talk, I want it to just be this. Pomegranate is more flexible than other packages. It's faster, it is intuitive to use, and it can do everything in parallel. Hopefully by the end of the talk, I've convinced you of at least one of these points. Uh, so Pomegranate has six main models that it currently covers, and it has two supporting uh, models that help, do, that help support these models. Uh, the first are very basic probability distributions, things like normal distributions, uniform distributions, and the like. Next are mixtures of these distributions, then Markov change over sequences, hidden Markov models, which are latent factor models for sequences, Bayes classifiers, which are an extension of the more commonly known naive Bayes classifier, and then Bayesian networks, which are very flexible uh, probabilistic inference techniques. However, one of the core tenets of pomegranate is that even though these are six separate things, they're all kind of really the same thing. They all kind of just represent probability distributions. And so we're very familiar with like a normal distribution and what that looks like. But a mixture model is really just a complex distribution. A hidden Markov model is just a distribution over sequences. And a Bayesian network is literally a probability distribution that's been factored along a graphical structure. This core insight into, uh, into d these distributions informs basically how all of pomegranate works. One of the things that it allows us to do is stack these models in ways that other packages don't allow you to do. What I have here are the distributions uh, as rows, distributions that you can stack inside other distributions, which are the columns. So on the top row, we have things like you can stack a normal distribution inside a Bayes classifier and get a commonly known Gaussian naive Bayes. That makes a lot of sense. Likewise, a more complex model might be that you have a GMM HMM, where you put a mixture model as the emission for your hidden Markov model. What I have in dark blue here are ways that you can stack models in pomegranate, and in light blue, I have ways that I'd like to support soon because the infrastructure is basically there. Um, some ways that you don't really see other packages supporting are things like if you want to create a classifier over sequences, you might have a hidden Markov model that represents each of your distributions and put your hidden Markov models inside your classifier. So that instead of having a Gaussian naive Bayes, you now have a hidden Markov model Bayes classifier. This is a comparison to other packages. That in Orange, I have ways that other packages allow you to stack. Uh, I have other. Orange means that other packages allow you to stack, but not nearly as flexibly as Pomegranate allows you to. And dark red indicates ways that you can stack in Pomegranate that no other Python package, to my knowledge, allows you to stack. So for example, just with stacking a simple distribution inside a Bayes classifier, that, uh, that one up here, you can create a Gaussian naive Bayes or a multinomial naive Bayes in scikit-learn. But in Pomegranate, not only can you create a um, not only can you create an exponential naive Bayes or a Bernoulli naive Bayes or any other type, you can create mixed, you, can, you can have different types of distributions modeling different features. And I'll be showing you that at the end. Given this insight that everything that we're dealing with is essentially just a probability distribution, the API is common to all of the models. This is the whole thing right here that under each one of these models, you can calculate the probability or log probability of a sequence. You can sample it because these are all generative models. You can fit like you would in scikit-learn. Uh, the summarize and from summaries methods that are highlighted there support the out-of-core API that I'll show you in a second. And then if you have compositional models, models that are made up of smaller models, like every, basically everything other than a basic distribution, you have the predict, predict proper and predict log proper methods from scikit-learn. And lastly, there's the model dot from samples which I'll get uh, into the different, this is a area which Pomegranate and scikit-learn differ with the fit and the from samples method. Pomegranate currently supports a wide variety of different, uh, of different probability distributions. I've highlighted the ones that I think are the most common in red, Bernoulli distribution, normal distribution, multivariate Gaussian. The way that Pomegranate is structured is very modular. And so this is important because you can create any of the more complex models by simply dragging and dropping any of these simpler models in. 
by implementing a log normal distribution, for example, now you can create log normal mixtures and log normal hidden Markov models without having to change any of the underlying code. So there are two ways of initializing models in pomegranate. The first is that if you already know the values that you'd like your model to take, you can just pass those in. For a simple normal distribution, you just need to pass in mu and sigma, and you can create a distribution like that. If you want to create a Gaussian kernel density, which is a non-parametric distribution, where essentially you just plop little Gaussian distributions over all the points, and the ultimate distribution is just the sum of those little uh, Gaussian distributions, you just plop the points in, and you automatically get your distribution. As a side note, because there are, this, there are these non-parametric distributions here, this means that pomegranate natively supports non-parametric mixtures and hidden Markov models. The other way that you can create a distribution is if you know the type of model you want and you have data, and you basically want to just infer this type of model directly from your data. In scikit-learn, you typically just do this by calling the fit method directly, but in pomegranate, you would have to do the from samples method, uh, like you would see here. So, to address the first claim, pomegranate can be faster than NumPy. Let's say we want to take a simple example where we're trying to just fit a normal distribution to around 1,000 samples. It's around twice as fast in pomegranate to do this. There are a few reasons why, but the main reason is because if you're doing this in NumPy, NumPy is trying to be as general as possible. So you have to first go through and calculate the mean, then you have to go through and calculate the standard deviation. In pomegranate, you know that you're trying to calculate a normal distribution, so you can go through the data far more efficiently and only calculate the numbers that you need. But that, doesn't, that, that seems insignificant, going from 46 microseconds to 22 microseconds. It's barely noticeable. This speed increase extends to larger models, though. Let's say that we want to fit this multivariate Gaussian to 10 million samples with 10 dimensions. We can see that it's around 20% faster to do this in pomegranate than it is to do it in NumPy. So I just merged GPU support as well for, uh, for pomegranate. And what we're seeing is around a four times speed increase across, a, across all of the models. On the left-hand side, we have a simple multivariate Gaussian uh, distribution with the cyan bars representing the uh, fitting the multivariate Gaussian to some data time and the uh, magenta bars showing the amount of time it takes to calculate the probability of samples given the points. So this is around a four times speed improvement over the values that I just showed you in the previous slides. This speed improvement extends to mixture models, that if you just add in GPU support, that you get around a five times speed improvement, uh, four times speed improvement when doing both fitting and calculating probability with this mixture model. This is enabled only because of the modularity of pomegranate, that all I had to do was allow GPU support for the multivariate Gaussian distribution, and suddenly all models that relied on it now have GPU support. Ultimately, this uses the package Kupai, which is fairly simple to install and is the back end to packages like Chainer. Um, and so it basically automatically infers whether or not you have a GPU and uses it, though you, you can turn on and off the uh, GPU. And to be clear, I just merged this into the master branch on GitHub, so it's not available yet if you pip install it. I'm hoping to get some more documentation, unit tests, and other GPU support in before I do a full release on this. But this is currently merged in. So like I had mentioned, if you know the type of distribution or model you're trying to fit, you can do it far simpler than just um, calculating the mean than calculating the standard deviation. For example, let's say that you want to calculate the, uh, the calculated normal distribution. You need to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. But you can get an exact update of the mean and the standard deviation going through the data once by simply calculating the sum of the weights, the sum of the weighted points, and the sum of the weighted points squared. By calculating these three values, you can exactly cal calculate the mean and the variance. So this means that pomegranate only has to go through the data once in order to calculate this and for every other model. A natural extension of um, these additive updates is that pomegranate supports out-of-core learning because there's no reason you have to store all of the data in memory if you're simply adding together these sufficient statistics that you load up one batch, calculate the sufficient statistics and store them, calculate, load up the next batch, calculate the sufficient statistics on that and add them to the previous ones and so forth. This is a, supposed to be two normal distributions, but they're basically identical to machine precision. The first one is if you just fit directly to the data and the second is if you use the out of core API in order to fit in batches to the data. 
naturally, if you have these types of additive updates, parallelism becomes a breeze. All you need to do is you take your data, you break it into chunks, you assign these chunks to different processes that extract the sufficient statistics from each one in parallel, you add these sufficient statistics together across each one of the chunks, and then you can calculate the new parameters exactly using them. Pomegranate is implemented pretty much entirely in Cython with the global interpreter lock released, and so we use multi-threaded processing as opposed to multi-process. Uh, multiprocessing, which is typically used in Python. This means that we don't need to be copying our memory across different processes and can be far more efficient when doing these types of numerical uh, things. Uh, another less intuitive uh, thing that this supports is semi-supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning is essentially the task where you have a whole bunch of labeled data and you have, a, uh, you have some labeled data and you have a whole bunch of unlabeled data. Frequently this comes up in the field of like computer vision. We have a ton of images on you know, Instagram, mostly of food and of cats. And then you have some labeled images, but you don't really want to be spending a bunch of money labeling all of the images in the set. So semi-supervised learning is the idea that we can start off using our labeled data to in initialize the model, then we can fit a supervised model using the labeled data, an unsupervised model using the unlabeled data, and add those sufficient statistics together in order to get a better update that uses both the labeled and the unlabeled data. Since Pomegranate is implementing these types of generative models that use expectation maximization, in addition to this being a possibility, this also makes a lot of theoretical sense. We're simply using expectation maximization in its you know, purest form in order to do semi-supervised learning. So we get a model that is far more intuitive to interpret, and it's also around 10 times faster than using scikit-learn's label propagation. So what you get uh, is that on the left-hand side, that's if you use only the labeled trading data from the previous slide. And on the right-hand side, you get the decision boundaries if you use both the labeled and the unlabeled data. You can see that the boundaries are less sharp, they're smoother between the classes when you use the unlabeled data. And so you're able to eliminate around half the error by you know, using all of this unlabeled data. So if any of you are in a situation where there's a bunch of unlabeled data that you could possibly utilize and you've since not utilized it because it didn't have labels, you can now use pomegranate with semi-supervised learning and just send me a cut of the money you would have spent otherwise. <laughs> pomegranate can also be faster than SciPy. Let's take the task where we want to calculate the log probability of some points under a multivariate Gaussian distribution, a large multivariate Gaussian distribution. This is 2,000 samples with 2,000 dimensions, so very large. Uh, we see that we're around twice as fast if we just do this natively using pomegranate, but if you've already created the distribution object, then we're around eight times as fast as using SciPy. The reason that this matters is because pomegranate uses aggressive caching over all of its models. Let's say that we have, we're trying to calculate the value of a point under the you know, normal Gaussian equation. We have the normal probability equation on the top, then we have the log probability equation in the middle. But you can see that the, the log term, the term right here, doesn't actually depend on your data, but calculating a log is the most computationally intensive part of this equation. Since it's a transcendental function, it requires a lot more computational effort than the rest. So when we create the object, we can simply cast this value because it doesn't depend on the data we're about to see. Likewise, we can do that with the two sigma squared, which probably isn't as big a deal, but it ultimately means that calculating the log probability of a point under a Gaussian distribution, now it involves only a handful of summations and multiplications instead of either an exponential function or a log function, if you're, or, or both, if you have a particularly bad implementation. So I've kind of rushed over a lot of the features of pomegranate, but I haven't really motivated why someone would want to use probabilistic modeling at all. So I think at this time, I should go to a real-world example that I'm positive that all of us have encountered in our daily life, and that is trying to analyze Gossip Girl. <laughs> so a few years ago, my girlfriend wanted me to watch Gossip Girl with her, and from what I could tell, it was about a group of angsty teenagers in Manhattan that took turns hooking up with each other and, in general, just disappointing their parents. Uh, in the background, there was this enigmatic figure known as Gossip Girl who sent out these text message blasts at the most inopportune times just to stir up drama. This is drama that, of course, could be solved if any of the characters talked to each other like human beings instead of, you know, gazing at each other from afar across a ballroom or glaring at each other to let them know that they're, they're angry at each other. So, of course, naturally I was hooked. <laughs> so this is the first uh, blast that was sent out. 
Spotted, lonely boy, can't believe the love of his life has returned. If only she knew who he was, but everyone knows Serena, and everyone is talking. Wonder what Blair Waldorf thinks. Sure, they're BFFs, but we always thought Blair's boyfriend Nate had a thing for Serena. What a shitty thing to say about just like... <laughs> this is over half of the main characters of the show, and this Gossip Girl character, who presumably is one of the main characters, is just dissing them. So in addition to like, you know, ragging on whoever this lonely boy character is, they're also ragging on Blair's boyfriend Nate for saying that Nate isn't being faithful to uh, his girlfriend. So the first episode ended with this one. Why'd she leave? Why'd she return? Send me all the deets. And who am I? That's the secret I'll never tell, the only one. So at this point, I turned to my girlfriend and not wanting to let her know that I was actually interested in this type of show, I said that if she helped me figure out who Gossip Girl is using data science, then I would continue watching with her. <laughs> so that's what we, that's what we did. So the first question obviously came up, how do we encode these blasts? And we figured we'd want to encode these blasts in such a manner that it was either plus one if it furthered someone's agenda at the time, or minus one if it went against their agenda at the time. And presumably the character who is Gossip Girl is going to be trying to further their own agenda at all points during the show. So here's an example. Better lock it down with Nate B, clock's ticking. This clearly is in support of Nate's agenda because Nate is trying to be with Blair, but Blair is being non-committal. So this is, you know, Negative for Blair. <laughs> Another one is this just in, S and B committing a crime of fashion. Who doesn't love a five finger discount, especially if it's the middle one? So for those not in the know, a five finger discount is stealing. So this is basically <laughs> accusing the two of the main characters of theft, which works against both of their agendas at the time. So you can imagine that at this point, you basically have a huge matrix where each one of the characters is a column, each one of the rows corresponds to a blast, and you have either plus one or minus one. So just take a simple summation, and the person with the, you know, who's most mo uh, supported by Gossip Girl is Gossip Girl. Unfortunately, that doesn't work out for two reasons. The first is that no one is unscathed by Gossip Girl, that everyone is in the negatives here. Uh, it seems like Blair, on the left-hand side here, is the most negative and so potentially the least likely to be Gossip Girl. But Dan, Nate, and Vanessa are all tied for most likely to be Gossip Girl under this model. So we're going to have to use probabilistic modeling in order to <laughs> snuff out the details of this problem. So we turn to the beta distribution, of course. The beta distribution essentially represents a probability between 0 and 1, usually modeling rates of things happening. The canonical example is trying to figure out the probability of a coin coming up heads. That if we did this, then we would start off with the blue distribution before we've uh, thrown the coin up or down any times. We don't know anything about it, so it's a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, representing the probability of producing heads. Then we flip the coin twice and we get two tails. If we use a simple maximum likelihood estimate, we're going to say this coin can't produce heads ever because it's only ever produced tails. That's kind of ignoring the fact that we haven't collected that much data, whereas a beta distribution models this nicely by saying that the most of the density is around not being able to produce heads, but there's still a possibility for it being something else. Then as soon as we see a single heads, the beta distribution does the appropriate thing. Instead of the mo it being the most likely thing that it can't produce, uh, that it can't produce heads, now there's a 0% chance that it can't produce heads because you just saw a head. It can produce heads. Then as you collect more data and you get perhaps 25 heads, 25 tails, this seems to converge to something that looks like a Gaussian distribution around the 50-50 mark, indicating that this is probably a fair coin. So, of course, we want to model this uh, Gossip Girl using this with the plus ones and minus ones representing the heads and the tails. After season one, this is what our distributions look like with the vertical lines showing our maximum likelihood estimates given the beta distributions. So it seems like after season one, Jenny in Cyan is the least likely to be Gossip Girl, whereas Dan in Green is the most likely to be Gossip Girl. After four seasons, we see the typical things that we would expect. The first is that these distributions converge as we get more data, that the variance of them decreases. The unfortunate aspect of this is that they all kind of converge together, and we were hoping that one of them would go somewhere else. And this actually matches with the, the rumors, or the gossip per se, about the show, which is that the producers had no idea who Gossip Girl was going to be. <laughs> and then suddenly the show got canceled, so they had to assign it to one of the characters. But perhaps they did know what they were doing, because, spoiler alert, 
According to this model, Dan is the most likely to be Gossip Girl, and Dan ultimately ends up being Gossip Girl. So this is a reason why you might want to use probabilistic modeling <laughs> in your life. Thank you. So with the time remaining, I'm going to go a little bit into a common model that I think that everyone has a little bit of experience with, which is naive Bayes. And essentially, this isn't as exciting as Gossip Girl, but uh, essentially what happens is that you can calculate the probability of points using a naive Bayes classifier as the posterior using Bayes' rule. Essentially, the posterior equals the likelihood function, which you get from like a normal distribution, uh, times the prior, which represents the class imbalance of the problem, divided by some simple normalization. Naive Bayes makes the assumption, though, that every, that every feature is independent of every other feature, that there's no covariance at all between the features. And so what you typically get is an, uh, a decision boundary that looks ellipsoid, something like this. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have pomegranates, naive Bayes, and on the right-hand side, we have scikit learns naive Bayes. It ends up being some sort of ellipsoid. Since this is just Gaussian blobs, it ends up being spherical, but it can be any general ellipsoid. But let's say that we have data that looks like this where we have segments that come from some sort of time series signal, and we want to classify them as either coming from the magenta phenomena or the cyan phenomena. Well, our features don't all follow Gaussian distributions. That the mean probably does, but the standard deviation seems like it follows more of a log normal or a gamma distribution, and the duration seems like it definitely follows some sort of exponential distribution. Simply modeling all of these as Gaussian distributions probably isn't going to be as effective as you would like. And we can see that just by comparing. The first two are implementing naive Bayes, you know, Gaussian naive Bayes using either pomegranate or using uh, scikit-learn. But in pomegranate, we can support different distributions on different features. That there's no reason why, according to that equation, we couldn't. Because as long as you have some sort of probability function, you can just, you know, multiply it by each, uh, multiply a different probability function across each one of the features. We can see that by using the normal distribution, log normal distribution, exponential distribution, the appropriate distributions for this task, we're able to get around a 4 to 5 percent uh, accuracy improvement without getting more data, without cleaning the data, without doing anything fancy, simply by using the appropriate distributions. This comes at no additional computational cost. If we compare an you know, increasing size model under pomegranate with an increasing size model under scikit-learn, it seems like they basically perform similarly, which makes sense because the update steps for naive Bayes are very, uh, very simple. So you get this additional flexibility at no computational cost. But pomegranate goes further and implements general Bayes classifiers. Like I said, naive Bayes has this assumption that each one of the features is independent from the other features. There's no reason you have to do that for, in order to use Bayes' rule. You can have any arbitrarily complex likelihood function there that has any arbitrary type of covariance matrix. On the left-hand side, we see what happens if you try to fit a naive Bayes model to this type of data. It's not just simple Gaussians, and so it doesn't seem like it performs very well. But if we explicitly model the covariance between the features using the right-hand side with a Gaussian distribution with a full covariance matrix instead of a diagonal covariance matrix, we get a much better model that seems like it eliminates around half of the errors. But even further than that, there's no reason why you have to use a simple distribution. You can just use a, you can use a mixture model as well. On the left-hand side, we, have the, we basically have this complex data that we might see in the real world where it doesn't fit a single phenomena very well. Um, we can see that both of the classes seem like they have several components to them. And simply modeling it as a single multivariate Gaussian distribution might not be the optimal thing to do. So on the left-hand side, we have using a single multivariate Gaussian. On the right-hand side, we have using a mixture of two multivariate Gaussians for each one of the classes. And you essentially get the guy on the Pringles can staring back at you. <laughs> so. To go back to the opening slide, pomegranate is more flexible than other packages. It's faster. I hope that you found it intuitive to use. And it can do everything in parallel using the additive sufficient statistics that I described at the beginning. There is documentation available and uh, documentation and an API reference on the Read the Doc site. Uh, so if you'd like any of the, if you want to read more documentation, it's there. If you want to have a, a look at tutorials for any one of these models, I've written brief tutorials for all of them, and they're available in the tutorials folder on the pomegranate GitHub. So I'd like, I'd like to acknowledge the institutions that I've uh, worked at over the last few years who have provided me with either uh, guidance, knowledge, or most importantly, travel funding, so that I can come here and speak with you. Uh, so thank you.
I think we have around a few five minutes for questions. Yeah. Yeah. So you're basically asking, does the out-of-core update produce the exact same update that the full fit method does? And it does because of these additive sufficient statistics. Um, essentially, you are, doing the, you are doing the exact same calculations. You're just not doing it in the same order as if you do the fit because you're loading up some data and then calculating the update and then loading up some more data as opposed to having to load up all the data and then calculate it. You get the exact same numbers. And in fact, the back end of pomegranate, the fit function just calls summarize and then from summaries once. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are you using uh, to implement parallelism? Are you using standard library thread pool? I'm using Joblib. Job. Yeah. I'm using uh, multi-threading multi option in Joblib. Yeah. Yeah, it's a stationary distribution for now. Yeah. I'm using MLA. Right, so I'm using expectation maximization followed by MLA on the distributions. Uh, for initial conditions, I use K means. Uh, so it works best for Gaussians, but it also has good properties for uh, other distributions because you start off and it performs best for Gaussians, but then EM allows it to fit to whatever appropriate distribution you specify. This is true, but all models might end up in local minima. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so this question comes up every time. Uh, <laughs> No, it, it's good because it means lots of people have the question. Essentially, they're doing similar things, but they aren't identical. That the, I give two, good, uh, two responses to this. And the first is that uh, pomegranate deals far more with discrete latent state, but you know, discrete or continuous emission state. So for example, uh, Bayesian networks, we have a discrete model, whereas PyMC deals with uh, far more on continuous latent state, where the result is that you need to do sampling-based algorithms as opposed to closed-form solution. Uh, the second is that you can essentially think about it that pomegranate models uncertainty in both your prediction, uh, sorry, pomegranate models uncertainty in your predictions, PyMC and its friends model uncertainty in both the predictions and the parameters of the model. Yeah. I think it supports both CUDA and OpenCL. I haven't yet tested it, which is why I haven't pushed a release that has it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't, uh, I haven't encountered that in the data sets that I've used that have millions of points. It is potentially a, po a problem if you have very large Gaussians. Um, a suggestion that I have to people is that typically in that situation, you can, try to norm you can normalize your data. That if all your values are between 10 million and 20 million, your values could just as easily be between you know, one and two. And that would make everything work nicely. Okay, well, thank you.